Well, that concludes uh, the questions. Um, so if you'd like to... Just on, on, on that point, I think courage and leadership are two words that are bandied around regularly, but we have 100,000 Irish citizens who are in fear of what happens in the future. It is incumbent upon the Dáil to draft legislation. We have a mechanism through the President and the Council of State and the Supreme Court if we want to stress test some legislation. So why don't we stress test legislation that starts to, balance, to rebalance the imbalance that's existed for seven years? And that's the courageous move that's required. Not something off the wall, something reasonable that protects those tenants and protects those people who are most vulnerable and those people who are on social welfare where they've lost both their one income within the family who do or don't have children within that household, they will end up homeless. They are in parallel to the homelessness that we deal with at the moment, the various crises. These people have dramatic mental health challenges as time goes on. That will come at a cost to the state. And Deputy Durkin asked earlier on, he's right, there is a cost to the state in relation to this, but there's no free houses. No one's advocating a free house. We're advocating someone has a safe home. And that requires courage, that requires leadership, and that requires a massive rebalancing of a dramatic imbalance in favour of financial institutions. We guaranteed, without any legal instrument, half a trillion euros. We pumped 64 billion into banks. We had multiple late nights sitting at the doll to protect financial institutions. And while we gave money to some banks, 56% of the banks, the others' existence, their existence is because the state stepped in. The entire system wouldn't have been existing. So there needs to be payback for those vulnerable customers, those vulnerable citizens who are now facing the abyss. And unfortunately, it, ourselves and many other organisations have done their best and are doing their best, but the numbers are now in an emergency situation and requires emergency legislation and this to be grabbed firmly. And I say, in any major disaster, one of the people that may be missing from this side of the fence when it comes to giving you um, some evidence are major disaster planners, because that's who you need. International major disaster planners who could tell you how to step by step deal with what's coming. Thank you very much. Uh, that more or less concludes this session, so I'd like to thank the Irish Mortgage Holders Organisation, uh, Mr Hall and Mr Curtis for your attendance today and the submission, which as I said earlier on will be uh, put on the committee's website. We'll now suspend until 2 o'clock this afternoon. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. We're now in public session. Uh, at the outset, once again, colleagues, I'd like to remind you of mobile phones or devices. If you'd either switch them off or to flight mode, please. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, or in, any, or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. Uh, the opening statements will be published on the committee's website after the meeting, and members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I'm pleased to welcome uh, the Residential Tenancy Board uh, here this afternoon, represented by Ms Rosalind Carroll, Ms Janet Fogarty and Ms Catherine Ward. You're very welcome. Uh, we have received your uh, full submission. Uh, it's been made available to the members of this committee. So, uh, Ms Carroll, if you'd like to uh, make your opening statement and we'll take it from there. Members will then have a number of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman and Committee Members, and thank you for the opportunity to address the committee today. I wish the committee well, and I'm very happy to assist the committee in any way I can today or in the future. I'm accompanied today by my colleague, Assistant Director Jeanette Fogarty and Assistant Director Catherine Ward. In my statement today, I'm going to concentrate on the rental sector. However, the dynamics of the rental sector, as you're aware, are part of a much broader housing system and any policy recommendations or development in the housing area need to consider the implication of that policy on all parts of the housing market. 
What I will briefly set out today based on the experience of the Residential Tenancies Board are the current trends and issues affecting the rental sector, the steps that have been taken to date to address some of these issues and some thoughts on approaches to these and potential future issues. The Residential Tenancies Board, formerly the Private Residential Tenancies Board, or the PRTB, was established in 2004. We currently have approximately 324 tenancies, which represents 172,000 landlords and some 705,000 occupants. And our remit is to regulate and support the rental housing market by operating a national system of registration for tenancies. We provide a quasi-judicial dispute resolution service for tenants and landlords, and we conduct research and provide advice to the Minister in relation to matters impacting the sector. More specifically than that, we produce a quarterly rental index, on, and it's probably one of the most extensive rental databases in the country. Our remit has also just recently been extended to include approved housing bodies, otherwise known as housing associations, who provide housing for about 30,000 tenants. And this change, and hence our recent name change, means that both tenants and landlords of these properties are now also protected by the Residential Tenancies Act and have access to our dispute resolution services. This is an important development, I suppose, not only because it breaks the traditional distinction in the rental sector between social and private rented housing, and it moves us closer to rental models elsewhere where you can't necessarily identify those differences. In terms of the rental sector itself, it has grown considerably over the last number of years, and the last census, census 2011, shows that one in five are rent renting in the private rented sector. If you include the social rented sector in this, this now brings the figure to just under one in three renting in the rented sector overall. And therefore the rental sector makes up a significant component of housing tenures in Ireland and is likely to be a continued feature of our housing market into the future. The growth in the sector can partly be explained by a downturn in the economy, decreased mobility with less first-time buyers and a lack of new supply. However, it can also be partly explained by longer-term societal changes and population growth. In particular, a rise in migration has given a rise to increasing demand for rental accommodation, and 75% of non-Irish nationals were renting from a private landlord in our last census. Combined with this, there are more people living alone and more people who need more flexible tenure options to facilitate more mobile work requirements. This means the increasing, there is an increasing demand for rental accommodation. And it's particularly important to maybe take cognizance of these shifting demand patterns as they su suggest a significant part of our society will rent rather than own their homes in the future. Therefore, we, not, we need to consider not just the much recognised need for more supply, but specifically the need for more supply of rental accommodation. The need for more supply is evident in the increasing levels of rent across the country, which have been driven by that lack of supply. According to our quarter four 2015 rent index, rents were 9.8% higher nationally than in quarter four 2014. That's still 9.1% lower nationally than the peak in quarter four 20, 2007. But what is concerning is the pace of the increase as opposed to the actual increases in them, themselves. While in Dublin, for the first time, rents have passed their peak levels in 2007, being 0.4% higher than ever before. The rate of increases started to decline in the Dublin area. However, pressures on availability are still evident, with availability of rental accommodation nationally the lowest on record. And the trends in our annual number of new tenancy registrations also evidences the pressures on the rental market and the lack of supply. Annual tenancy registrations peaked in 2011 with, 11, with nearly 112,000 tenancies registered in that year, but has dipped consecutively in 2014 and 2015, while our overall numbers of registered tenancies have increased. And this suggests that tenants are staying longer in their properties. The volume of disputes referred to the RTB has increased steadily in the last number of years, and this is expected given our larger sector, and also we have done an increasing amount of education and awareness campaigns. But what is significant is the changing nature of disputes referred to us. So cases involving disputes over deposits used to be our highest dispute type, whereas now rent arrears and overholding make up our greatest number of cases, accounting for over 33% of cases comparing to 20% of deposit cases. Rising rent levels mean that tenants are finding it more difficult to meet rental payments, leading to a greater number of disputes regarding rent arrears and overholding issues. 
The overall aim or vision of the RTB is to have a well-functioning rental housing sector in Ireland that is fair, accessible and beneficial to all. This is a challenging vision in the current environment. The Minister has introduced a number of legislative changes to address some of the issues in the market and these include new rent certainty measures whereby rent cannot be reviewed more than once in any 24 month period, an extension of the notice period of rent review from 28 days to 90 days, a requirement on landlords when undertaking reviews to provide details of three similar properties in the area, an extension of notice periods for both landlords and tenants in respect of termination of longer term tenancies of up to 224 days in the case of landlords and 112 days in the case of tenants and stronger verification procedures are also required in relation to terminating a tenancy where the landlord intends to sell or refurbish a property. There's also been measures introduced to ensure that both tenants and landlords know more about their rights and responsibilities. It's perhaps premature to assess how far some of these measures will go to addressing some of the current issues, but what is important to remember is that some of the measures introduced have been introduced on a temporary basis and will expire at the end of 2019. And therefore it's important to consider not just the very real and immediate issues, but what the future of the rental sector should look like. In this, the committee are urged to consider the short and long-term considerations of any policy proposals. And to return to the vision of the RTB, as stated, this sits out that we should have a well-functioning sector that is fair, accessible and beneficial to all. We need to recognise the fact that renting will be a much more common choice for Irish households into the future. We need to accept and welcome a larger rental sector that is reflective of our modern economy and society with a more flexible and mobile workforce. We need to no longer view the rental sector as a residual sector where people serve their time onto something more long term. And to accomplish this, we need the rental sector to be attractive to both tenants and landlords alike. There are a number of specific challenges to be addressed if we are to achieve this. How do we balance the needs of the tenants with the needs of the landlord? As what is certain is that we need both a willing landlord and a tenant to enter into a tenancy agreement. How do we ensure we build to rent as well as build for purchase by owner-occupiers and accommodation that is appropriate to our changing demographics? How do we, in the future, ensure competition in the market to ensure rents are competitive? At present, we estimate that about approximately 80% of our landlords own only one or two properties. The profile of landlords, though, is starting to evolve, with REITs and institutional investment now playing a bigger part in the sector. Looking at examples elsewhere, institutional investment in the rental sector is common, but it is balanced between for-profit and not-for-profit providers. How do we deal with the immediate challenge of the 29,000 buy-to-let mortgages in arrears for over 90 days? How do we consider the needs of people as they grow older in the rental sector and their disposable incomes reduce? And finally, but importantly, how do we transition to whatever policy paths are chosen, taking account of the current profile of the sector? A strategy specifically for the rental sector will not magically solve the much wider supply pressures experienced in all sectors of the market, but it is critical to bring certainty to tenants and landlords on the long-term future of this sector. Investors need certainty, but so too do the tenants on issues such as security of tenure and rent regulation. There is a need also when looking at the overall housing landscape to have an understanding of what tenure mix we are aspiring to and underpinning this with suitable policies to make this happen. In a modern society and economy, a vibrant rental sector is vital and it is important that the rental sector does not again become the forgotten sector. The RTB's role is, to develop, is not to develop policy but to regulate the sector in accordance with the legislative framework within, it, within which we operate. However, the service we provide in the rental sector give us a unique insight to the sector and we will support in any way we can the development of solutions to the current housing crisis. We will continue to raise awareness of both rights and obligations of tenant landlords to support a well-regulated sector. Thank you, Thank you very much uh, for your opening statement, Ms Rosland. Okay, members, who would like to start? Deputy O'Sullivan. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, I suppose I would have been looking for some more definite proposals that you would be suggesting to us to pursue in relation to the difficulties that you're having with the, the work that you're doing. So that would be the first point I'd like to make. Um, the pace of the rent increases, we know that. And I, I don't believe that the legislation, I think the legislation probably worsened the situation instead of trying to improve it. And I'm wondering if that's your experience as well. Um, 
You're talking about, you know, I'd also be interested to know about the length of time on settling disputes, that the, the, those issues that come to you. And then there is the, the disparity between perhaps settling it and then the implementation of what has been agreed and enforcing that. And I'd be interested in your, your views on that one. I mean, a big thing is for tenants is those, particularly those tenants who are in substandard accommodation and their fear of making a complaint to the landlord um, because of what that could lead to. Um, so there are a lot of tenants who are living in very substandard accommodation and what can be done about those to take away that fear. Um, I think deposits are still an issue. Um, people who are being left waiting on deposits, they have another pre uh, tenancy to go into but they don't have the deposit in order to, to pass that on. Um, I should leave it at that for now. Thank, thank you. you, Deputy. Deputy Durkin. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> and I welcome our guests and thank them for their, their submission. Can I, can I compliment you uh, on your work in determining in uh, disputes mm -hmm. uh, to the satisfaction of tenants? Uh, I'm, I've attended a number of meetings and I think you have done extremely well in, in establishing a respect for your office and also in coming down on the side of the, the, the person who is most vulnerable in the situation, while at the same time observing the rules and the regulations. I don't agree, un unfortunately, with your, your assessment of the societal change that in the future we should rely more on rental property. In actual fact, that's the cause of our problem. Uh, that was introduced, I was at the meeting, Chairman, some years ago, when that was first floated on the same grounds, uh, that this would f facilitate society and job relocation to a greater extent than, than, than previously. It didn't work that way. In actual fact, what it did was it made rentals as expensive as, as mortgages, which is the same today, and it, it, it gave no, um, no security of tenure to the, to the or, or relatively no security of tenure uh, to the tenant, uh, and it gave a huge amount of put a huge amount of power in the hands of, of those providing the the the, um, the, 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 the the property. And I don't want to go into the, all the rights and wrongs of, of it because I am a strong supporter of the need to provide uh, properties. Uh, for direct purchase either to the local authority for allocation to the tenant and the, the and, and, and the, the public sector and in the private sector for 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 purchase by the potential owner and recognizing that one of the problems and this is is, is my view uh, one of the problems associated with the boom was the extent to which multiple properties created a, a, a bubble uh, for multiple speculators uh, who in turn made massive fortunes out of potential uh, building land and, and properties to such an extent that nobody can afford, nobody could afford uh, the, 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 either the rents or the mortgages. And I, I, I don't want to reiterate what I've said before, that a person on my salary, Chairman, and your salary as well for that matter, cannot afford the average mortgage now and cannot afford the average rent now either. So I think those are things that we need to ponder on. Anybody else at this section? Deputy Function, and then I'll go to you, Ms. Ms. Yeah, I'd just like to, I'd like to agree, first of all, with a lot of what Deputy O'Sullivan said. Um, I thought we'd have a bit more detail in relation to proposals. Just the length of time it takes um, with disputes, um, that's what I'd like to know about. And, and um, if I, I don't expect that you have that information maybe to hand, but if we could get maybe a further breakdown of that in terms of even on a regional basis, you know, roughly how many disputes are in each region and, and the length of time, because my experience is people just either don't report it in the first instance or, or abandon it halfway through the process because they are afraid of losing their, their um, you know, the landlord will kick them out in relation to it. So just like to get your comments on that. Okay. Ms. Carroll, do you want to address those questions first? Certainly. Um, I'll just start with Deputy O'Sullivan's uh, comments. Uh, your first in terms of more definitive proposals, uh, I suppose while the RTB, we're a regulator and we don't make policy uh, and therefore we haven't strayed too far from that except talking about the facts more so than anything else and I think that's probably something that we have a strength in trying to bring to the fore. Um, 
With saying that, we did in 2014 uh, produce a report by DKM which went to the Minister um, with a series of recommendations, uh, one of which was the rent certainty, some rec rent certainty recommendations and some recommendations on tax relief. The main recommendations in that report, which was independent of us, um, was that you needed to tie in tax reliefs with any regulation on the other side and that there had to be a balance between the two in order that it wouldn't impact on supply. In terms of going further, and I know the, the committee has talked maybe about more measures on rent certainty and sale and so on and security of tenure, some of that was discussed within that particular report um, and I think it's fair to say that the issues from 2014 have only increased uh, since then so um, I wouldn't take that report as being um, it was written at that time and obviously the issues have continued to go on since, since then. In terms of, I suppose I'll go back to, to, to the main points that what I was trying to say is obviously it's a matter for the policy makers and, um, and the minister to, to, to make a decision and, and the recommendations of this committee in terms of what will come in. For me, we need to think about the reactiveness of any decisions that come in if there's further regulation that's prompted by that. Um, and think about the profile of our sector. So when I talked about the 29,000 landlords that are, are, have mortgage arrears of more than 12 weeks, we have indications that there's a number of landlords. We have, I think, between 60 and 70% of landlords who currently have a mortgage. Of that, we know that there is a proportion, maybe 25%, if not more, who are talk, talking about wanting to sell, to sell. The difficulty with introducing regulation is how and when do you get there? What's the direction of travel that you're going to do it so that you don't spark off a reaction whereby suddenly you might want a more professional rental sector in the future, but in the meantime, the 80% of landlords that we currently have that own one to two properties suddenly decide to sell their properties tomorrow because they know that something's coming in. And you mentioned the rent certainty measures. Our experience with the rent certainty measures is that they were talked about for 12 months. In actual fact, people started increasing their rents from the 12 months prior to those discussions starting to take place. And probably there was a little uplift straight after they um, came in. Now, we, our next rent index isn't due out until June, so we don't know if they're starting to dampen or not as of yet. But there is a, a reality of having to bring certainty to where we're going, or people start reacting in ways that we can't determine. And I suppose that's one of the key messages that, w that I wanted to give. So it's not our role in the RTB to say you should do this or you should do that. But what I would say is we do need a clear direction of travel for both tenants so they understand where they want to go in the market, but also for landlords in terms of increasing supply of rental properties and to try and give some sort of understanding to the existing market in terms of where they're going to go. And we need to ensure that when we do that, that we suddenly don't create some unintended co consequence. And they would be where I suppose our profile and knowledge of the sector that I think we could offer some assistance in that going forward. Um, in relation to the length of time on disputes, um, the length of time on disputes has increased significantly um, in terms of our, we've reduced them significantly over the last three to four years. Now we have two services that we provide mainly if you're making a dispute. We have a, a mediation service which is now free um, and the waiting time on that is now only four weeks to make a, a, an order. Um, and then on uh, adjudication, if a tenant or a landlord chooses to go down an adjudication route, you're talking about two to three months to get a determination order. Those are compared to averages of about 18 months previously in maybe three or four years ago. That's where the RTB's timelines were. So there's been significant efforts made. It's also worth mentioning that the mediation service that we now provide is the first of its kind. There's no other telephone mediation service in Ireland. Um, and it's quite a, a, an approach that's non-adversarial in terms of trying to address issues between tenants and landlords. It has led to a situation where we have far less appeals. So both the landlords and the tenants are coming out happy from the process and are not appealing them further up the line. Okay. Just on, on yeah. From the time of an adjudication to an implementation. Okay, so if um, a party appeals that to a tribunal, there is, in terms of due process, there's 21 days if some, uh, a, a party wants to appeal it. And therefore, then, by the time the case is heard, you're talking about it can add a further two to 